there will be Oh, there we go. Now we're recording. Uh, there will be an opportunity to choose from the breakout sessions, and those will require you and we'll, we'll remind you again to go back to the lobby and then look at the sessions and choose one of the case studies there. So each time you have to go back to the lobby. And so we appreciate your patience and your willingness to work through this Zoom events with us. Uh, we're trying it out. We think it has a lot of capability and we hope it works out really well because there's a lot of good um, information and presentations and we don't want you to miss anything. But we're all here to help you. So I think I've covered the logistics and now I am excited to introduce the plenary speakers for today. Dr. Drew Koch, he is the Chief Executive Officer of the Gardner Institute. And he and Dr. Felita Williams, Associate Vice Chancellor for Strategic Academic Initiatives at the University System of Georgia, and she's also a fellow with the Gardner Institute, will be having an interview dialogue uh, to introduce us to this chapter. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, oh, let's see. Let's see if I covered all things I was supposed to. So the overview of the day, I did miss a couple of things. Uh, Drew and Felita will go through the plenary and then we'll jump into the case studies. As I mentioned, you'll have to go back to the lobby and choose one of four case studies. And then there will be an opportunity to return to the lobby and then go to the session where you, you participate. This is your piece of the action. Uh, where you will have the discussion and shape the discussion on socially just design in, gate, in the gateway course system. And then we'll talk about next steps and let you know about what's coming up in the next uh, chapter. So how's that? Now I'm ready to turn it over to Felita and to Drew. Thank you, Dr. Koch. How are you? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Dr. Koch. Good afternoon, Dr. Williams. How are you? I guess they caught it. We have two Dr. Koch's here, so I have to work my way around. How are you today? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. I'm really excited about this conversation that I'm going to have a chance to have with you about socially just design. But before we sort of dive into that, tell me a little bit about what motivated you to write this essay and a little bit about what's behind the essay title. Sure, sure. And, and by this, uh, the essay, you mean the, uh, the essay, Many Thousands Failed, right? That, exactly. Um, cool, cool. Yeah, no, which is actually, obviously, the, the title of our discussion today. So, so thanks, Dr. Williams. Um, and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I, I will say that um, I approach many things in life, and some who know me well will probably say all things, even when I'm not aware um, as a American studies historian, uh, you know, as uh, everything has a history and history is everywhere. Um, and it was through that vantage point, or at least that proclivity, that um, I was doing some readings in uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, and a bit of a viewing and self-education around the works of James Baldwin. You know, I viewed a documentary that came out around that era uh, called I Am Not Your Negro. I had read uh, his essay, Many Thousands Gone, uh, many other aspects. Um, and I happened to be doing that uh, probably serendipitously in a coterminous manner as Brent Drake and I and others at the Gardner Institute were enabled by Rob Rodier, Ethan Campbell, we're beginning to compile and collect data on gateway course outcomes in work we did with a number of institutions. We also happened to be working at the time, or at least exploring work at the time with our colleagues at the American Historical Association, right? Now I wanna emphasize the Gardner Institute is uh, an organization that's focused on helping colleges and universities improve teaching, learning, student success, and in the process advance equity and social justice, but not just in history, right? But we, we had a budding and have a even uh, far more developed relationship with the American Historical Association. We're fostering other relationships with other discipline associations. And I happened to be in conversation with uh, Jim Grossman, 
uh, executive director of the American Historical Association, as well as Emily Swafford and Julia Brookings. You'll hear from Emily and Julia later today uh, about some of the early findings from the research that Brent and I were doing. And they must have said a half dozen times, Drew, you got to write this up, Drew, you got to write this up. And in early 2017, or actually late 2016, early 2017, they allowed me to attend um, the annual meeting of the AHA and share in a pre-conference format some of the findings. And Emily, she didn't quite corner me, but almost cornered me. And she said, no, really, Drew, you have to write this up. And so it was a combination of events and factors, right? That whether it was my readings around Baldwin, uh, my bit of viewing around Baldwin, uh, the work we were doing at the Gardner Institute, and just encouragement, really strong encouragement, not forcible, but strong encouragement mm -hmm. from our friends and colleagues at the AHA that um, I wrote the Many Thousands Failed essay with a, with a take from or a take on a play on a nod to Baldwin and his Many Thousands Gone essay. Now, the reason why I did that is has to do with the message that Baldwin was sharing in Many Thousands Gone and particularly a passage in that where Baldwin wrote, the story of the Negro in America is the story of America, or more precisely, uh, the story of Americans. And then he continues in the very next sentence that it is not a very pretty story. And I wasn't looking for a way to apply that. It's just that when Brent and I really dug into the disaggregated data on income, on race, ethnicity, and outcomes in gateway courses, uh, the same statement could be said, whether it was about African-American students in foundational level courses or it was uh, low-income power receiving, receiving students, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? It just wasn't a pretty story. So um, now the essay itself, because, well, the good news is that my AHA colleague said, oh, by the way, you have to do something with it. So write something for perspectives on history. And it has to be less than 1500 words. Now, those who know me know that I can more readily and easily write 1500 pages than 1500 words. So the, the encouragement that the AHA gave was also a bit of a challenge, um, given that it was in the American Historical Association's Perspectives on History um, magazine, I limited the focus to history courses, right? But rest assured, the findings span far beyond history. So, you know, what's beyond it? Well, as I shared a little earlier, everything has a history. Gateway courses and gateway course outcomes do in fact have a history and they're embedded in the nation's broader history, which has a great deal to do with race and income in the United States and the legacy associated there with in the present day, right? So, um, so there you go, Dr. Williams. That, that's okay. what compelled me to do it. And, and that's what's behind the title. Again, nod to James Baldwin here. Okay. So one thing I want to point out to everyone that's participating with us today, Dr. Foote dropped a copy of that uh, essay, of the essay we were discussing today in the chat. So if you've not had a chance to look at it, it is available to you. And I want to thank Dr. Foote for doing that for us. Um, and so... Um, you wrote this, um, you've talked about it, 2016, 2017. Uh, tell us a little bit about any response you got at that time. And maybe um, if you were to do it again in 2022, would you do any changes? So um, I was actually surprised by the response uh, or responses, plural. Uh, both on the part of my history colleagues, but also by colleagues outside of the discipline of history. Um, you know, I, I, if I worked directly within the AHA, I, I probably wouldn't be surprised by the scope and scale of reach of materials that came out of the AHA. But I will say in 2016, 2017, I really didn't think anybody was going to read it. Um, and it, it turned out no people did read it. Um, and not, again, not just historians. Um, our AHA colleagues, uh, you know, were, were able to share it with others and were able to uh, 
encourage or, or, or gain the support of colleagues at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation so that we could do a project with um, 11 institutions called History Gateways now. I'm focused on redesigning foundational level history courses. But again, I, I have heard from persons outside the discipline of history. Uh, and I actually even heard from persons um, who said I didn't think history was quote unquote a hard course um, or who said, okay, now that I know what history look like, looks like, what does foundational level biology look like? Or what does foundational level chemistry look like? Or I, I, you don't have any information on foundational level accounting, do you, right? So, so questions along those lines from both discipline associations and individual faculty. So it's, it's both shaped uh, and informed discussion, not just in history, but across other disciplines. Um, it's shaped some support uh, for work that we're blessed and fortunate to be doing with the AHA right now on, on redesigning of uh, some foundational level courses, as I mentioned earlier. You know, it, it was the, the evidence in the uh, used in the essay that, that Brent and I mined and where Dr. Drake, Brent Drake, did the analysis came from 2013 through maybe 2015, 16. That was the baseline evidence. Um, you know, I, we recently, Brent and I were in conversation with representatives from one foundation to remain nameless for the time being, at least where we were exploring how we would do this again, do this study again. And it needs to be done again for multiple reasons. Uh, one of them being that it's the baseline data is over a decade old. Um, we have data that goes really through the current academic year, uh, more from right before the pandemic uh, so we, we want to replicate the study because we need the freshest set of data to consider. And then there's that other word, that P word that I said earlier, the pandemic itself and its impact on enrollments, uh, behaviors in courses, instruction in courses, and what that is meant for student learning and student success in foundational level courses. Um, you know, we, we had the emphasis on just design and unjust design and equitable outcomes, even in that essay and even in the preliminary work. And that's not because we went in with an a priori lens saying we have to have that. It's because that's what the evidence showed. I believe, I have no reason to believe that that will be any different than any analysis we do right now. As a matter of fact, I have reason to believe it's only going to be exacerbated given the challenges and issues associated with with the pandemic. Um, so, um, you know, the shared a bit about the response, shared a bit about where we'd like to go. Uh, the foundation that we're speaking with also encourages us to think about, well, who else may be an audience for this sure. and um, how may they benefit from and apply this in their own works. So, you know, we're excited to think through that. I think the foundation wants to see that transpire because you know, in the nicest way, they're saying, Drew, don't keep, don't keep coming back and asking us to fund the same thing, right? So, um, you know, ways of, of finding ways to collaborate with others. But those, those are the, the, the big takeaways, takeaways. We need to replicate this because it's now, it's not 2013, 2014, 2015, when we collected the baseline data. And we know as agents of history acting in history to shape history that we need to take into account the events of the, of the present uh, and reflect on them. We have to avoid presentism, but we have to reflect on them and see how they're different than even what we found 10 years ago. Exactly, exactly. Well, you know, as, as you mentioned, uh, quoting James Baldwin about telling a story and telling a story that's not so pretty, that can be very difficult. And in, in, 29, in a 2019 essay published by in the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, Professor Zimmerman, who's a historian at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, ask a question, social justice according to whom? And in this essay, he makes the case that, you know, some efforts focused on social justice in colleges and universities may amount to uh, some form of indoctrination. And so for educators who are interested in doing this work and um, moving, advancing 
uh, social just design forward. Can you talk a little bit about how they might be able to avoid being deemed indoctrinators? Um, not only can I, it's vital and thank you, right? And, uh, and without naming names or, or airing uh, too much dirty laundry, even the response to this volume of the series mm -hmm. in terms of in, uh, invitations that have gone out have um, garnered replies uh, to the effect of we don't do wokeism here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's one example, but there, there, there are sadly many others. Uh, I, we exist in a climate where uh, there's divisive concepts legislation. I, you know, I, I think there or know that there are persons who believe any effort around social justice, particularly in conjunction with post-secondary ed education institutions, smacks of indoctrination. Mm -hmm. um, what, and I think that's a that's we're right to be concerned about that. Um, I think if uh, we're moving forward in work like this and saying it's irrefutable, and if you question it, you are opposed to the progress in society, uh, isn't it of itself actually a form of a tyranny and a form of uh, indoctrination, or not indoctrination, but it's a, it's a rigid, rigid stance, right? Sure. Um, and I think what Zimmerman was encouraging was to say, make sure that in the process of you know, pursuing justice through what one does in post-secondary education institutions. And I'm not Zimmerman, obviously, I'm Koch, both good uh, German immigrant names, but we're, we're not related, don't know each other, right? Um, but um, uh, that you allow for diverse voices and you allow for critique, right? And I'll use as an example in my discipline, um, again, um, the history wars that are going on right now, and not necessarily even in the discipline, but outside the discipline and the broader mm -hmm. public, uh, which is at the root of some of the divisive concepts le legislation, actually uh, is at the root of divisive concept legislation, period. Um, and, you know, that is if you, one takes a look at something like the 1619 project, right, without getting into that too much, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful, well, initially, uh, set of um, articles and then podcasts and, and, and now book, right? And um, there's much to be uh, valued and admired about it. There are also some things in there that aren't right, right? And I, and I don't say that. And just the ability to have that conversation is important, right? We have to be able to say, here's a resource that has value. Here are also some factual challenges with it. And by the way, uh, Hannah Nicole Jones and her co-authors on the book acknowledge those factual issues and have rectified them in the book, right? Or at least addressed them in the book. That's civil discourse. That is what is at the basis of just design and a just society, right? Where, and concepts cannot be beyond uh, being questioned because if one cannot question a concept, that's the antithesis of uh, you know democratic critique, and I mean democratic with not the political party sense, right? In the way of uh, uh, national uh, conversations focused on engagement, empowerment, and franchisement, right? So, uh, I, I, I Zimmerman's essay, of course, came out in 2019. Um, you know, it was pre-pandemic, pre-George Floyd, pre Amwad Aubrey. Brianna Taylor, et cetera, right? Uh, but it was not pre 400 years of legacy of race and class and other aspects in the United States. And I think Zimmerman was coming from a good place by saying in the course of being adamant about certain things, don't make it so rigid mm -hmm. that you're beyond critique. Make it so that reasonable persons of all ilks can find common ground in this. So to me, socially just design and post-secondary education has to be open to critique and criticism. And, be, and in addition, it has to be 
because of the fact that, you know, Shirley Malcolm has often said this, my colleagues have heard me say that, I said this in the intros, right? Shirley Malcolm from the American Association for Advancement of Sciences once said to me, you know, Drew, fixed don't stay fixed. So even when we get it right, we won't have it right anymore. We better darn well be critiquing it and be open to critical and criti constructively critical. And it may seem not constructive at the onset, but um, constructively critical voices in all of this. So, you know, for one, we need to understand that socially just design and post-secondary education as it's defined here isn't the advancement of a rigid set of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, it's about focusing on um, who has power, how is power broadly distributed or not distributed, how is it concentrated, and what are the implications of that for uh, our country or other countries, you know, depending where one is involved in how does post-secondary education reflect and shape that, right? And, and that's what social just design is about. And if it's about enfranchisement and broader participation uh, by uh, persons previously of low income backgrounds, persons who uh, are immigrants to the US, persons who are persons of color, right? Uh, whomever, right? If it's about broader participation, then we have to look at the structures that inhibit that, right? That's what socially just design is about, right? Questioning that and structuring a more just system, right? So that everyone can succeed regardless of the conditions of their birth. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. And you know, it seems that, um, and you've touched on this just a little bit, but I'm gonna ask you to go just a little bit deeper, that the study of the DFWI grades earned in, in your perspective of history article reveals some interesting facts about students um, and failure of just one foundational course. Yeah. And so if you would talk a little bit about that in those findings. Sure. And I'll start with history, but I'll only stay there for about 60 to 90 seconds. Okay. Um, because it's a bigger story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just about history. So what we found uh, is when we worked with the data in aggregate, we found that you know, history courses had about 25% uh, rate of D grades, F grades, W for any form of withdrawal or I for incomplete, which, you know, some people could say, hey, that's pretty good. Three quarters of the students were earning a C or better, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when you begin to dig into that, then the plot sickened, right? Um, because what one saw when you broke it out, both by race, ethnicity, and also by income, by students who received the Pell. And there are a ton of white kids in that Pell category, right? So uh, although there's a, a lot of overlap with race as well, but when we looked at that, that DFWI rate for Pell recipients, for students of color, African-American, Latinx, indigenous students in particular, uh, was significantly higher than the course average or for white counterparts, although there were a lot of white students in Pell, and Pell was significantly higher than non-Pell, right? So income and race mattered. Um, what we also found is that earning a D, an F, a W, or an incomplete in the course was also directly predictive of whether or not the student was gonna be back at the institution the next year in even just one course, right? So this was an analysis in history, students in otherwise good academic standing, right? Which mm -hmm. is defined as a 2.0 or better. Now there'll be those who argue, well, a 2.0, that's not great. Well, at most institutions, if you have a 2.0 at commencement, you can walk across the stage, right? So that's why we use that as a threshold. Mm -hmm. Students with a 2.0 or better who had one course with a DFWI rate grade on it, were significantly less likely to return to the institution a year later. And in a study Cliff Edelman did not once but twice of uh, every student in post-secondary education over an eight year period of time, um, that sort of outcome in a course in, a, in one foundational course was predictive of not only not returning to an institution but not finishing anywhere later, right? So we saw that with history and now let me go broader. We also saw that with general chemistry, general bio, yeah. principles of accounting, mm -hmm. first college level calculus, first college level algebra, psychology, English writing. Uh, those were the eight we looked at at the time. We're gonna expand the study. When we do the next one, we'll probably look at 20 to 30, right? And I would not be surprised if we saw it also in uh, 
intro political science and intro social, intro anthro, econ, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. That statement that I drew on with a nod to, towards Baldwin with it not being a pretty story and then saying it's not a pretty story in foundational level history. It's not a pretty story in any of the gateway courses we looked at. And it's particularly associated uh, with race, ethnicity and income. So if we're looking at post-secondary education as a uh, engine of social mobility, and we also can say, look, looking at the evidence that students who do not succeed in these courses tend to be lower income and or students of color, uh, and that they don't complete, mm -hmm. then basically gateway courses either are engines of social mobility or engines of social, social immobility. Right. And perpetuation of inequity. Right. And that was the big shocker, the big concern in all of this. Yeah. Right. It's it, it wasn't we didn't go in looking for that, but that's mm -hmm. what we found. And it was in every gateway course we looked at. And I think the most surprising thing for me was just the one course, a student yeah. who is doing well everywhere else, just the one. Um, and, and that's impactful and that's powerful. And all institutions are struggling with retention. And so this is this is a uh, touch point that we need to be mindful of. But as you talked about looking at the DFWI grades, um, I'm going to use the term you used uh, a little earlier, the civil discourse. Uh, I can remember at uh, when we worked with DFWI grades at the university system when we were working with uh, Gateways Completion, our faculty were a little concerned about grades being yep. um, the measure. And so would you talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, the goal of the work? At the end of the day, um, we are interested in deeper learning and uh, equity in student learning and success, right? And I give a nod to if, if uh, some persons may be very familiar, some of the participants today may be very familiar with the uh, uh, work of David Lottie and um, out of the University of Texas at Austin and the New York Times did, I think in about 2015, 16, the New York Times Magazine did a, a story called Who Gets to Graduate? And it was about his work. And it was about a focus on mastery of content. And how masterfully he was able to when shifting to that focus to eliminate race, ethnicity, income, and other variables as the greatest predictors of not only who succeeds in his intro chemistry course, but in mastery of the content and in the program of study up into completion, right? So, so I mentioned this, we focused on grades because we believe if you're giving grades, and I also know that there's a lot of issue with this logic, right? I admit that it's loaded, that they should be at least indicative of what was learned or mastery of content in a course. If, if, if not, why are you giving them, right? Um, and in the absence of having a standard measure of learning gains in courses, we had grades, right? So it, it and we had grades from 50 plus institutions in their foundational level courses, along with student level data, so we could do the analysis that we did. So we looked at the grades um, and used them as a proxy, right, for mastery of learning. Um, we also believe, and let me make abundantly clear, that you know the, the response, well, if we want to make sure students succeed, just give everyone an A, is another form of unjust and inequitable design, right? And it's highly dangerous, right? No, if you want to make sure students succeed, make sure they master content and make sure you create structures and use strategies that enable that. Um, again, a la David Lottie and others who have, have done that in foundational level courses. So, um, and when you do that, by the way, like Lottie found, you wind up raising expectations. You mm -hmm. don't lower them. Mm -hmm. So to, to us, there is no justice without uh, mastery of content in these courses for a broader swath of students. And that does mean raising expectations, but it also means meeting students where they are and getting them where they need to be. Exactly.
Exactly. And um, to the participants, if you are following along in the chat, Dr. Foote continuously drops um, the, the articles and the references into the chat. So you can find all of those in the chat. Just want to make sure everyone's aware. Okay. So you, you talked a little bit you, um, the, uh, about uh, your the nod to Baldwin and his writing. And uh, so to sort of paraphrase his saying that if it's not a pretty, it's not a pretty story. And many times it's not a pretty story. If it's, if we are trying to correct or fix something that's not a pretty story, what can be done about it? I am super glad you asked this question. And you've known, we've known each other for at least six, seven years, right? So you know me well enough that I, I tend to harp on and really focus on the ugly story because um, it really disturbs me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you're asking this. You know, my um, partner in uh, today's uh, chapter, Dr. Steinkoch, and in life broadly, frequently says to me, Drew, don't, don't get on there and just depress everybody. Right, so, and the good news is I don't have to just depress everyone with this. These are reasons that one should be compelled to act. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the past 25, 30, 35 years in particular, right? And that doesn't mean uh, efforts didn't exist, but there have been many, many advancements and a broadening of the body of scholarship on teaching and learning and evidence-based practices that, uh, has allowed for, you know, as I mentioned earlier, David Lottie to focus on ways in which students can better master content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or as you know from your own work in the University System of Georgia, right? Uh, I think all of them now, but at the time that we were engaged uh, with the institutions, many of them were dealing, de developing centers for uh, teaching excellence, teaching and learning. CEDLs, I believe, was the verbiage in the University System of Georgia, but comparable elements exist us elsewhere. There's no dearth of wisdom and knowledge, particularly in the STEM fields, but not only in the STEM fields, said mm -hmm. the historian, um, about what works, right? In evidence-based uh, equity-focused teaching and learning. So the good news that is there, and there are many examples of individuals, but more importantly, institutions and collections of individuals who have applied those practices. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that um, we know a lot about what works. Uh, and as Elaine Seymour, uh, co-author both talking about leaving and then talking about leaving revisiting about why students leave the STEM fields. Um, you know, Elaine said to me once, Drew, it's not that we don't know what works, is that we adopt it, try it once, it's hard, and we stop using it, or we adopt it and then adapt it in a way that is completely antithetical to the approach that was devised, and then we say it doesn't work, right? So, uh, you know, my suggestion is if you're fortunate to have uh, a center for teaching excellence, teaching and learning and staff there, and you're not familiar with evidence-based uh, equity-minded pedagogies and approaches and practices, go introduce yourself. I bet you they'd love to meet you, right? And if, and if you are those people, thank you for what you're doing, right? So it's, uh, um, uh, and if you don't have one, uh, there are national channels, whether they're in discipline associations. I mean, I referenced the American Historical Association, but it's not alone in this, um, in, in efforts along these lines. Um, there's the Gardner Institute, hello, um, doing some of these things as well, right? So, so there is so there are many more resources available today than there were even 20 to 30 years ago, right? I, I remember um, David Pace out of Indiana University, again, a historian, but it's more than just historians, um, it said the historian you know, uh, wrote an essay in the mid 1990s talking about the amateur in the operating room. Mm. talking about how, um, uh, uh, or he joked once with me that uh, in the early 90s, uh, 
the classroom was a lot, a lot, a lot like the bathroom, right? Everybody knew that something went on there, but you weren't allowed to talk about it, right? And, um, you know, so I mentioned that this isn't now, this isn't, I mean, this isn't then, this is now. There's a lot that we can talk about, and Lottie was using it. No longer should we be amateurs in the operating room, right? We have resources to go to. So the good news is those exist, right? And they can be applied in efforts to create more equitable learning and success and a more just design and gateway courses. So, so Dr. Koch, I'm gonna slide one more question in. We're really tight and we're gonna open this up for questions. So sure. if you have questions, please drop them in the chat now and we'll get to as many of them as we can. But if you will uh, talk just a little bit before we go open it up to questions about how this fits in with the declaration for socially just design in post-secondary education. Sure, and this is the one time I'm gonna use a slide because I thought you'd ask this question. Okay. And I'm glad you did, right? So, um, and I'm gonna use it because um, a number of you may have joined one of the three introductory installments here um, for the volume two of the Socially Just Design series. And you'll remember that we used a framing document, a declaration for socially just design and post-secondary education. I'm not gonna make you relive that, but for those who didn't have the opportunity and are saying, wait, what? I wanna spend a little time in making that connection. So again, I'm glad you did this, Felita. Um, there were really four articles in that declaration and it's still very much so in draft mode. I'm not gonna focus on the first article, but I will focus on the second one because this to me is where the gateway course system connects with a broader declaration for social just design and where a declaration for social just design can be shaped by and informed by what goes on in the gateway course system. You know, in that declaration in the second article, and again, draft form, so, and we've invited anyone and everyone, including you fine folks, if the spirit moves you to weigh in on this over the weeks and months ahead is we have uh, an article that's focused on equitable student learning and success being the foundation for social justice design and post-secondary ed, right? Uh, we did this and this verbiage is used because of conversations I've had with my colleagues, uh, a lot of conversations I've had with John Gardner, but many other colleagues too, right? That often we hear when it comes to student success, the response that I shared earlier, just give everyone an A. No, you cannot have equitable student success if there's not equity in learning high expectations and learning at the forefront. So we focus on equitable learning and student success. Um, and, you know, there we define it as the hallmark of an excellent higher ed experience, right? The second piece on this then is the, the area where we zero in and land smack dab in gateway courses, right? And we do this in this principle, um, the second principle in this, in the second article, um, where we say that courses, curricula, and those who teach them, right? Whether they're tenure, tenure tracked, um, you know, adjunct, contingent, what have you, right? Um, are, are vital to the work here. And we do that because often what we found, at least until recently, is that this has been an overlooked area. Often the work around student success has happened to support what goes on in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. And what we're saying is that this is the heart of the academic experience. So you have to make this the heart of a socially just design um, in post-secondary ed. And then the last element in all of this, because I know we're short on time, the third principle in this article is that um, you need to use those evidence-based high impact practices, policies, program tools, but keep a constant eye on equity and student learning and success while doing so, right? You have to answer the question, high impact for whom? And remember the statement earlier that I made around making sure just design is making sure that every student, regardless of the conditions of their birth can succeed in gateway courses. Again, I, I will acknowledge that there are some students who maybe from a maturity standpoint, a timing in life, maybe couldn't write in that moment, but uh, Sandra McGuire, um, had pointed out one of my favorite scholars on student uh, learning and teaching pointed out, she said she estimates that's maybe 10 to 15% of the students in gateway courses. Why did we have 45 to 50% DFWI rates, right? So, you know, I'm emphasizing these three principles. This to me, like this has got obviously in one of them courses, but gateway courses 
and it's socially just design and post-secondary education. This is where they intersect. This is where the rubber meets the road. You can't do one without the other. So I'm going to stop for now, Flader, because I can go on. We did, uh, you know, I can go on and I won't because we want to open it up to other questions. Do we have questions in the chat? We do. Thank you, Felita. Um, let me just, this the first one is a little bit long. Let me read it. It says, we are trying a psychological intervention in an already redesigned introductory biology course, as well as an embedded, as well as embedded tutoring. It is too early to tell. It's too early to tell if our intervention is working, but we are optimistic. My underlying concern is that the course redesign has not addressed all of the challenges, mm -hmm. but the faculty are sure are sure it is awesome. Thoughts on how to nudge faculty to think about socially just design when they are convinced the course is not the problem. Mm. So first a quick comment, I love embedded peer support and I love it um, with acknowledging that this line comes from Kay McClenney, but because quote unquote at risk students don't do optional. Um, and I would argue that just about every student is at risk at one point in time in one way, shape or form, right? So when you embed it so that there's no elements associated with stereotype threat um, or even just flat out ignorance, um, and I don't mean that pejoratively, I mean that in the truest sense of the term, then, then you don't make it as something that's got stigma attached to it. It's just what everybody else does in the course. And by the way, you just raised expectations, right? So, but... Um, I, I think make it an academic exercise in and of itself and continue to provide the, the course redesign and the ongoing design and, and, uh, of the course. We may think we have the perfect model and until presented with evidence to the contrary, um, we'll continue to think we have the perfect model. Uh, now, it may be a scenario where while we're doing these things, these are exceptionally well, and that's where perhaps um, allowing for and incentivizing in some cases some experimentation around this to uh, see what types of innovations and then bringing that back in a structured community practice for your psychology faculty so they can see some possibilities and it's coming from other psychology educators right so um, I you know this gets back to that statement or that uh, quote that I attributed because you really said it to Shirley Malcolm right about fix not staying fixed it may be perfect right this minute, but I am willing to wager it won't always be perfect because conditions change, students change, institutions change, the instructor changes. And so it has to be part of a continuous improvement uh, effort. And also if you can incentivize some side innovation openly, but um, you know, it, it may not be with everybody at first, then the possibility for alternatives will more readily emerge. Thank you, Drew. Um, so Dr. Williams and Dr. Koch, I know that Dr. Williams, you often talk about um, in your work in gateway course redesign, how um, one of the eye most eye-opening points of data was the data from the students and their own lived experiences. So I would ask you both to just talk a little bit about how do we incorporate the student voice and the student experience in course redesign? Well, I'll, I'll just reflect a little bit on the work that was done, <clears throat> excuse me, at the USG. Um, as we went through the gateway to completion process with the Gardner Institute, there was a survey that was sent to students where their impressions and thoughts were collected about the redesign uh, before and after. And I think what was important with that and from faculty as they talked with me and I heard them talking to each other about the work, they talked about how much they discovered uh, in the replies from the students that maybe they thought they were communicating one thing, but the students were actually hearing something else. And it sort of clarified their work and uh, it made the students feel involved and like this was do being done with them and not just for them. And so I found, I think I, we found, our faculty found that this was an important aspect in the work, not easy to get the students to fill out the uh, survey. And believe me, that lots of little tricks and things were done to encourage student participation. But when you can get the participation, it was it was amazing and um, informative. 
I'll also add that you can garner perspective from surveys or you can garner perspective from um, focus groups with students. You can also garner student voice and have students shape the learning experience by using students as co-designers of the experience and even in some cases as uh, peer level instructors. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that's not meant to replace the faculty. It's, it's meant uh, often in some ways to supplement what transpires. Now that could be embedded peer support. We talked about that earlier. Uh, it also could be peer instructors, right? The University of South Carolina with its University 101 model uh, has peer instructors and often, and by Nevada State did the same, although embedded peer support uh, and peers or, or the students say they, they learn a lot, a great deal, and are more receptive when they, they hear it from peers. That's not a jab at, you know, faculty types, we faculty types, the, those who teach and structure it. Um, I'll also add that uh, our colleague and Gardner Institute fellow as well, Peter Felton, has done work with his colleagues at Elon around peer instruction and using peers in design of courses. Peter's not the only one who's done it. I'm dropping his name in case you want to go talk with somebody but I'm sure Peter can point you to others and other resources on that. So, you know, it's not simply about voice in survey form or voice in focus group form. It's actually about agency and the shaping and delivery of the course itself. Uh, that can be very, very fruitful from both the learning experience. And by the way, not just for the students who are in the course, but the students who are doing the peer work, right? Very deep learning happening there because they have to help teach it, right? So. I saw a question pop up. Katie, do you see it? Yep, yep, I'll you. ask it. So what is the advice on encouraging faculty towards socially just design who facilitate learning and programs that hold reputation prestige for rigor and selectivity? The experience that we are having is that there are students who generally have a desire to succeed in a particular major with faculty who believe that they should have arrived to the major with a certain level of preparedness. This could be fine arts, design, engineering, et cetera. My, um, maybe it's a frustration, I'll just call it that. Let's call it what it is. Around the use of standards and rigor is that they're code, they're buzzwords for not changing anything. Um, when, uh, and I, I don't mean that as a jab, right? And that's not the way I'd lead or start with a conversation with somebody who, who brought that up. Um, I, I would, and we do, we do this at the Gardner Institute, uh, just engage in a conversation with the evidence. Does rigor mean half of the students of color and over half of low income students fail? Is that what you call rigor? Now, if the argument is, well, I can't help that they didn't come prepared, then it's a conversation around, well, these are the students we have. What are the things we can do? And if this guy Lottie at UT Austin can do it, why, well, I shouldn't say it this way, but why can't you? What are the things we can learn from this? How do we incentivize this? Um, so I, I, it has to be an invited conversation. It has to be a discussion. It has to involve evidence. Um, we have heard uh, from a number of folks that they had never seen evidence like this before until they underwent a course redesign efforts. So it was easy to say this is about rigor. And as a matter of fact, one of the responses I got to the uh, Many Thousands Failed essay and another essay I did as a follow-up was, well, I'm a faculty member who has to make sure that bridges don't collapse. Well, even that, and that person was out of the civil engineering discipline, even in fairness, there's a licensure, licensure exam that guarantees that engineers who do that don't design things, at least ideally don't design things that collapse. And I don't want the bridges that I drive on to collapse. What I wanna make sure is that we can actually have more engineers who know what they're doing, right? And I, I think some of it also is an emphasis on, on 
uh, the roles of courses. We had a scenario in a foundational level physics course, not that the Gardner Institute offers physics, but we were working with an institution that was redesigning a physics course. And they actually got together that physics was the foundational level physics needed for pre-engineering majors. And they got together with engineering and had a conversation. And I almost felt like we were in the marriage and family therapy equivalent of course redesign, right? Because the engineering faculty say, we never talk like this, right? And they said it in, in the best of ways, right? They were, they were speaking to each other. And the intro physics folks were under the firm conviction that they were maintaining standards for engineering. And what engineering said is, well, our standards would mean they knew how to do this, this, and this. So focus on mastery of that content and you'll help us not just maintain, but raise standards because the challenge they were running into, as one uh, professor once said to me, not in engineering, but rather in biology, is I keep hearing about needing to have diverse students and students from low income backgrounds in my course at the junior level. They're in the course in the first year, but I have to tell you those students don't make it to the junior year. So I, I think the conversations about understanding about what's needed further down the pipeline, uh, scaffolded learning, and um, what expectations really are. You can move away from rigor and maintenance of standards to mastery of learning. And there will be elements along the way, right? We're not saying give anybody A who has a master of learning content, but if you focus on mastery of learning, uh, you will have more successful students who can do better. And then no one has to worry about driving on bridges, right? So anyway, um, I've belabored that a few too many anecdotes, forgive me. Um, there, thank you, Drew. Um, there is another question about a database or website that collects materials or examples of redesigned STEM courses. Um, and I will um, add one thing on our website. There is a, um, a an anthology, two, two um, volumes of anthology on redesigned um, uh, courses. So um, some of them are STEM. So I would highly recommend those, um, that, those collections. They're available to download for free, um, but there may be other things. So Drew or Felita, do you know of any other things? And I will just one point add a little um, promo for one of the next um, case studies. Brian Dewsbury is an expert in redesigning STEM courses. So he'll also have some ideas. You're muted. I'm sorry, I know some of the USG work is, is involved in those two anthologies that you're talking about, and I, I assure you there's some STEM, but I'm going to defer to Drew on this one. So there's a wealth of information that the various directorates in the NSF have put out. I would recommend looking at uh, uh, do the Division of Undergraduate Education and um, to me, and this may be reflective of my ignorance, I'll say it so, um, but in my last effort to look, it tended to be um, sort of pigeonholed in the various discipline specific realms, right? So I don't know of a comprehensive source in the National Science Foundation that shows this across the various STEM disciplines. Uh, there are many sources from reports within the NSF that can show within specific disciplines and specific investments, particularly in the uh, IUs, the Innovation Undergraduate STEM Education investments that get made. So that those are some sources if you're on sort of the, the hunt. I would say look at um, Elaine Seymour and Amberie Hunters. They were the primary compilers and authors of uh, talking about leaving revisited in particular, you could look at the Elaine Seymour and uh, Nancy Hewitt version from the 90s. It's it's not bad. It's just that talk about leaving revisited came out in 2020, 21. So it's a, a more contemporary version, uh, an updated version. There are many, many examples of uh, both what works and what doesn't. Uh, and reasons why, uh, including elements associated with curve grading, uh, you know, uh, and a host of other pieces to, to consider as one thinks about structures and processes and practices in STEM courses. I, I um, 
we'll say room? this. Yeah. Yeah. We need to I'm we need to, to give interrupt. plenty of time to our cases. So we're gonna what? <laughs> we want people to have a chance to move on. So thank you. Cut off. Yes. Thank you very much. That's the hook. Bye. This yeah. is the virtual hook. Uh, thank you so much to Felina and Drew. You're hey, welcome. Dr. Williams. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. yes. And uh, I'm going to quickly share my screen so you can see. Hopefully, you're seeing this now, which tells you that we are on a break. I wouldn't call it a break. I would call it a let's get moving to the case studies, um, which will begin at 2.05. So what you will do, even though it seems scary, is push the leave button on uh, the meeting, and then it will take you back to the lobby, and then you'll have the opportunity to choose one of four case studies. They are here listed, uh, listed and they, will, they each have a little picture, and it says 2.05, and you will want to click on uh, the join button when you see the case that you are interested in. So at this time, we need you to push the leave button and then it will send you back to the lobby. Hopefully it will not send you anywhere else, but just right back to the lobby and go off to the case study that you're interested in. And then we will return back to the lobby and then to the final session after that, which is titled, creating a movement and it's listed at 240. So again, that'll be in the lobby on the session side. So go ahead and start pushing the leave button and head to the case that you are most interested in. And if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we'll try to get you some help. And is Brandon still in the lobby helping out people or he's moved to a room? Um, Brandon is in one of the um, rooms and I am going to end this session. Okay. So everyone will need to go into the lobby.